Hello, this is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team, and this session thinks about supervisory relationships. Now, two of the key pieces of advice that both supervisors and new PhD students are given when they embark on those uh, relationships is to think about communication and to think about expectations and to uh, clearly communicate your expectations. So obviously communication is a really key thing, but I think that can mean many different things to many different people. And for me, the intersection between supervision and communication really comes down to supervisory styles. So it's thinking about different ways of working, um, different styles, different preferences, and how those vary between supervisors and their PhD students. And then thinking about how those impact what you want to communicate, how often you can communicate, um, the ways in which you'll communicate, and so on. Now, supervision like parenting tends to work on a, a similar or opposite sort of basis. So you either try to mimic what's, what works well or you try to do the opposite of what fails. And we see this across lots of different studies of supervision. And neither approach is necessarily helpful because the truth is that uh, there is no one set way of doing things and you really need to be responding mindfully in a given situation rather than just applying one model across the board. And that means that you are kind of evaluating from scratch every single time. And what I want to look at here is helping you to understand how you can do that, what you can focus on, and certain techniques that might be helpful for you as you are doing that. Over the next couple of slides, I want to think about different types of supervisory styles. And there are many out there. I'm just going to pull up a few to walk you through. And none of these is right or wrong. They all have benefits and, and drawbacks. But the point is to show you different sorts of things that people have come across as they've been doing research and talking with supervisors and with students. And, and these are all the elements that they've found that people have emphasized as being important to them in different contexts. So the first of these is a model by Gatfield and, and more recently updated by Stan Taylor. And this model thinks about how supervision is generally always going to be a trade-off between the amount of support that you're offering and the amount of structure that you're offering. So you can see here that they've divided this uh, layout into quadrants because more or less you could fall into kind of a, a high or low of each one of those things. Now obviously these are all going to be spectrums in real life. It's not going to just be four distinct categories. But the idea is here that you can start to come up with terms that help you to think about what might this sort of style look like. So for instance, if you've got someone who's providing a, a really high structure, so they're saying here's what needs to be done on each of these days, here are all these different timelines and deadlines, and they're also providing quite a lot of support, then that's going to start to feel quite interventionalist. Basically, this is a person who is practically doing the degree for you as a student and is not allowing you to have much of an opportunity to make your own choices, to come up with your own structure. On the other hand, if you've got someone, just to look at the exact opposite there, who is providing no structure, they're letting you make up all the rules as you go, uh, and they're also providing very little support, that's going to feel like quite a laissez-faire sort of approach. And if you're a student who needs to actually have more guidance, if you're someone who's coming into a, a topic or who's coming into HE without having much experience, actually you might both need and want a bit more assistance. You might want some nudging in the right direction in terms of how you would approach something. You might want a bit more guidance on certain tasks and so on. And so you can start to think about where you might fall as a supervisor just uh, instinctively. What is your preferred approach whenever you're managing anyone or working with anyone? And you can also think about from your point of view as a student, where do you most, most naturally sit? And you can start thinking about the people that you work with and where do they sit and, and what might those relationships mean for how you get on and how you work together. Another model of supervision is one that's developed by Gurr in 2001. And this one is more um, taking into account where a student is on their overall journey or where they are in terms of a certain task that they're most recently working on. So this thinks about kind of what someone's been doing most recently as a supervisory style and also where the student is in terms of their kind of growth in a given area. 
So you might have a student who goes anywhere from dependent to autonomous, and that might be over the course of the whole program. It might be over certain elements. It might be over certain uh, areas of expertise. So you could think about that in many different ways. And as a student is hopefully going from dependent to autonomous, which I think is generally what we are aiming for in any type of education and over the course of any sort of uh, job, we do want someone becoming increasingly more proficient. What you would start to see is that perhaps the supervisor might start off being a bit more hands-on and giving some advice and then little by little uh, letting go and letting the person stand on their own two feet. However, that's not always what happens. So you might have someone who's hands-off all along, or you might have someone who's not very good at relinquishing control. And you can then think about, if that's the way the supervisor is, depending on where a student is, might some conflict start to arise. So if the supervisor is being really hands-off at a time when the student is quite dependent, then that might start to feel very neglectful for the student. On the other hand, if the supervisor is really hands-on when the student is basically about to finish up and they're an expert in their own right, you could start to see where someone would chafe under those circumstances and there could be some real conflict there. So this is another nice way to approach how you might be thinking about the amount of guidance that's needed given where someone is in their development of expertise within an area or across the project. A slightly more complicated supervisory style is one by Anne Lee, and this one was proposed a little bit more recently in, in 2012. And she has, after doing quite a lot of uh, research, talking with both supervisors and students around the world, she's decided that there are four main categories of supervisory style. So one type of supervisor tends to look at more functional things, so they are acting more as a project management uh, kind of role. Another supervisor tends to look more at enculturation, so that's showing someone what is it like in your discipline. How does someone in this discipline typically act? What are the things that they do? How do they talk? Where are the places that they go? And so on. Others are more interested in critical thinking, so this is where you're basically just, regardless of discipline or regardless of the particular project, just teaching someone to ask the right questions and to think in a certain way. Then you've got someone who's more interested in emancipation, and this is basically just helping someone to be a free thinker, no matter how they're thinking, just to do that in their own way and to make their own decisions about that. And finally, you've got the style uh, of more relationship-focused work. So this is more of a pastoral role, ensuring that someone is feeling excited about the project, that they're supported, that they feel like their well-being is being, being taken care of. And what Lee found was that actually very few people are just one of these things, but there tends to be one dominant one and then one or two others that are pretty strong, and then the others they care less about. And in sessions that I've run with supervisors, I frequently find that people are most interested in the critical thinking, although it's not always true, and then there will be maybe one or two others that they're quite concerned with. And that there is some varying across the disciplines, but actually across the board, that critical thinking piece is really important. And then the others, the second place choice is kind of up in the air. And there's a, a, a very long quiz that Lee has put together or survey to help you realize what type of supervisor your style is most like. And that's quite a nice thing if you ever want to go through it. And I can um, put it here at the end of this session if you want to work your way through because that gives you an exercise of thinking what are your own preferences and you can perhaps anticipate for the people that you work with whether uh, who are those who are supervising you or those who you're supervising you can think what are their most likely priorities and how do these things fit together and again what we typically find is that where there is not a mesh so if you're interested in functional and someone else is interested in the critical thinking, there can start to be some tensions because you're having different expectations and desires and priorities. Another way to think about supervisory style is to ponder the role that you want to play. So I'm gonna pause for a moment or suggest that you pause for a moment and think about which of these roles you would like to play which are most appropriate, which are not appropriate, and how might these things be conveyed in your communication? So what would each look like? 
what would distinguish in terms of communication style someone who's taking a master-servant approach versus a colleague-colleague approach, for example? So when you are ready, pause the video and think about that. Think about where your preferences are and what those might look like, how you can embody those. And when you are ready, you can come back and press play and resume. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to think about this a little bit. What I will tell you is that most of the times that I show this to current supervisors, there are chuckles about a couple of these. So master servant and guru disciple tend to make people feel very uncomfortable. And uh, they often think of those as jokes until I tell them that actually there are people who propose those. That's why they're in this model, that this was actually based on research where someone found that these are, each of these is something that an actual supervisor has suggested. It encompasses the relationship that they have with their uh, PhD student. So there are some that certain people absolutely never feel, feel comfortable with. And there are others that people debate. So colleague, colleague, and friend, friend, for example, often come under discussion, especially friend, friend, because people always talk about the difference between being friendly versus actually being a friend. And how do you uh, achieve one without necessarily doing the other if you need to keep professional boundaries? So these are questions that you definitely have to ask yourself and think about whether you're clear about what you want and whether you've communicated that clearly and whether you're signaling that clearly throughout the relationship with your supervisor or with your student, depending on um, the nature of your given relationship. I will also tell you that the one that always stands out as being people's favorite tends to be guide explorer. And I think that a lot of people find that appealing because it doesn't necessarily suggest that there is inequality. It's more that uh, there are people who are on the same path, they're interested in the same destination, and one perhaps has a bit more experience navigating it, but they're going on that journey together, and you never know what's going to happen on the journey, and it might turn out that by the end you're on equal footing, or you're helping each other, and so on. So even though there is perhaps a bit more experience acknowledged in that, there's also a suggestion that uh, there's not necessarily going to be a permanent relationship where one person always knows more. So that one also feels quite positive, I think, because it's about finding something new and exciting rather than managing or overseeing, which can start to sound very corporate. Most people tend to feel that the healthiest relationships, whatever the labels you want to put on them, whatever the style that you're bringing, um, given those previous slides I showed, are the relationships that incorporate some element in some way or another of coaching and mentoring. And these days, when we're talking about pedagogy, when we're talking about teaching style, the words coaching and mentoring come up quite a lot. But I don't think that people necessarily know what do those actually look like and how are those two things different. So again, I would ask that you take a moment and perhaps pause the video and just think, what does coaching mean to you? And what does mentoring mean to you? And how would you distinguish these two things? And perhaps you can think back on someone who has been an actual coach in your life. Um, that could even be a coach in the sporting sense or a coach in more of a um, scholarly sense. And you can think about your own mentors and perhaps begin to see how might they have had some similarities and differences. So when you're ready, pause the video, think about how you might define these, and then press play again and we'll see what some of the pedagogical responses are. Okay, so we're, we're back after the pause, hopefully, and I can reveal that, at least according to this definition, which I think is a pretty standard one, coaching is a type of helping interaction where you've got someone who perhaps isn't the subject expert themselves, but they know how to approach a particular problem. They know how to approach a particular topic. And so although they're not telling you the answer necessarily, they're not giving you the, the exact details and methods that you need, what they are giving you is the tools to become self-directed and independent and to be able to find those answers on your own. 
And this is, I think, it's actually much clearer if you can use that sporting analogy. And if you think about a lot of coaches, even people who are retired from the sport themselves, they are people who no longer can uh, make a goal or run in a certain speed or whatever the particular skill is. But what they do know is how to help someone to tap into that potential in themselves. So even though they can no longer do it, they can give you advice about how you can go on and do that thing. Mentoring is uh, something where you've got someone who is a subject expert and they are a bit further ahead. They're more experienced. They've had a broader range of uh, experiences within that particular context, whatever it looks like, they have lived it themselves and they know about something a bit more and they are still in that area of expertise. So their knowledge is still fresh, it's still um, current and they are still drawing on their own resources in the moment in order to advise you where you are. So this is something where you do have someone who's saying, look, if I were you, here's what I would do because this worked for me. And you can think about how uh, often there are supervisors who are supporting students who have started doing a project that's actually not entirely in the supervisor's area of expertise. And they no longer can tell you the exact answer to certain questions. But what they can say is, here are the sorts of journals that you might want to look at. Here's how I would go about contacting a person to find out how to do that method and so on. So they can give you those broad skills, even if they can't give you the specific ones that you need for a certain question. And these are things that you might be um, bringing into a range of relationships, actually, not just supervisor or supervisee, but also other relationships as well. You can use techniques from coaching and mentoring. When you are employing those techniques and drawing on coaching and mentoring methods, you're going to need to have guiding conversations where you can achieve the goals that you have. And of course, conversations are associated with communication, so that's why that's an important thing to look at here. And you'll notice that those conversations um, align to some of the supervision-specific terms and ideas that we were thinking about in these previous models. So we're thinking here, for example, on the left, you can see that grid where you've got skill versus will. And this is talked about a lot in coaching and mentoring in, in terms of how you're trying to bring people along with you because you need to figure out uh, what exactly you need to say in order to help them be independent and self-starting, in order to help them find those answers, in order to motivate them to follow in your footsteps, and so on. And this is very similar to the sort of in-the-moment assessment you would be needing to do as a supervisor in order to respond to what a student's been doing, how dependent they are, etc. And so you can see where this does sort of map on. To start with, in terms of thinking about skill and will specifically, you would need to think about whether you're choosing appropriate language in order to uh, move someone in the right direction, in order to ask the right questions and get informative responses and then give them a response in turn that will help them. Depending on your own level of knowledge and also the students, you're going to need to express yourself in a particular way. So I want to spend a little time here looking at how you might be able to do that. In the world of coaching and mentoring, often we think about how there are three broad categories of ideas that you would need to cover in your conversations. Thought, statement, and action. So thought is how you would express your own thoughts versus how you would find out what the student is thinking. Statement thinks about how you provide a factual piece of information versus how you might ask what someone else has done or how they might approach a thing. And finally, action thinks about how you might explain how to do something versus suggesting innovative ways of thinking or doing. So the overall pattern here, as you might notice, as I'm going through each of these, is that one of those is much more leading and basically handing someone the answer, and the other is much more prompting and trying to get someone to suggest that answer to you. And probably from those definitions on the previous slide, you've already ascertained that coaching is the one that's less directive and mentoring is a bit more um, already constructing those ideas and then handing them over. 
So how might that actually look different uh, in, a, in a real world conversation? Well, when you're mentoring, if you're thinking about the, the thought category, you might be saying something like, well, my experience is, or I know how to do this, and so on. But in coaching, you might just be saying, how can I help you? What do you need from me? So rather than volunteering, you're asking them to give you some direction. Thinking about statements, you'd be saying something like, well, this is how I would do it, or here's how this technique works. But for coaching, you might try something more like, what have you already tried? Or what do you think is possible? Or what were you thinking might be the next step? And all of those, as you can see, are going to have very different outcomes in terms of uh, prompting someone to work through something on their own a little bit more. Finally, with action, this is the difference between providing guidance, providing advice, and just basically handing someone the solution, which can absolutely be appropriate in certain circumstances. I think we can all remember times when we've just wanted someone to give us a steer because we truly don't know, we've already been through it all, or we're tired and we can't think or whatever. So that this is not at all to be dismissive. But then the more coaching approach would be to Suggest how someone might explore something different. Um, here are some things you might try. Have you gone off to talk to this person? Maybe you should go look up at these resources. And basically you're giving them a whole bunch of new steps to follow before they then might come back to you and say, actually, I've tried all of this. I still can't figure out the answer. So these are all um, comparisons that you might want to make for yourself whenever you are thinking about what sorts of conversations do I need to have with someone and which of these do I want to achieve? Do I want to kind of nudge them in the right direction or do I want to just try to get them standing on their own two feet? And you can also think about what sort of conversations are being had with me. So how is my supervisor per, uh, perceiving me and which of these relationships are they having with me and is that actually what I want? And when you get a sense of these sorts of answers, that can help you to think about why a relationship and a collaboration might be working well, or perhaps why there is some friction. I'd now like to build on that knowledge uh, a little bit more and, and suggest that when you are having these conversations, whether they're coaching, mentoring, or something else, they all sit within an overall communication style. And the five things that you see here on the screen are the five factors that have been identified by research as being critical for facilitating a productive exchange. So when you are asking those questions or giving those comments, you also need to be doing that within the context of having some rapport, having a longer term relationship, showing different types of listening to someone and engaging with what they're saying, responding to them flexibly, having questions that make sense and are actually moving the conversation along and also providing feedback. And what I would like is for you to now take some time to think about what each of those would look like. How do you build rapport? How do you demonstrate that you're listening? And what are some more or less extreme ways of doing that? And so on. So what you can do if you like, so you could obviously just sit and think about those and jot down some notes, but hopefully you all can work with each other, even though you're accessing this resource at different times, and you could start seeing what other people have left. So what I'd like is to suggest that you use the link at the top to go to the PowerPoint that that links to, and it's just a PowerPoint that lists on five different slides each one of these topics. And you could then, for that topic, if you have a tip to share or a thing in your mind that you think encapsulates this, find a picture or a series of pictures to um, portray that. So for example, if you think that different styles of listening, uh, you really need to have good body language to show that you're listening, you could find an image of someone ap applying an appropriate posture showing listening and you could copy and paste that into the PowerPoint. And I would suggest that if you could do three tips, so three tips for one topic or one tip for three topics, whatever is good, that would be fantastic because each of you could then start to populate this and we would start having a collection across lots of different participants, collating those ideas, visualizing how you could go about achieving these things. So when you're ready, you can pause the video, follow the link, do that, and then come back here.
ultimately, all the things that we've been exploring in this whole session here boil down to the four tips that you see here on the screen. And we've already discussed these in some form or another. So first of all, you and your supervisor and supervisee, depending on which role you're in, will each have expectations. You need to be aware of those, you need to compare them, and you need to preemptively tackle any discrepancies. And this is why one of the things we always suggest is that when you come for induction, and when you meet someone that you're working with for the first time, you actually overtly have a discussion about expectations. And you might even use something like the setting expectations form, which I will uh, post here for you to look at below. And you can use that form or modify a form like that to your purpose so that you actually will figure out what are the sorts of expectations you have, what do they have, and how different or similar are you. And if you can put those side by side and compare, that will help you immediately to know where there might be sources of tension. And you can say, right, here's how we're going to deal with this if it comes up. And that will help you to avoid problems in the future. As you go along, you also need to pay attention to each other so that you can pick up on cues and signals in order to be present and really evaluate the person in the moment. So not just overall, you think you know a person and this is how they act. That might be true. They might typically act or feel a certain way, but you never know how someone's going to be on a certain day. You never know what's going on in their personal life that might change things. And so you need to always be aware and really observant every single time you interact with someone so that you can adjust accordingly and not just rely on your assumptions, which might not be uh, useful in a particular situation. Depending on your evaluation, you then need to also be flexible and adaptable so that you can find a way to relate to that person in a way that's going to work then and there. And what is helpful is if you have already thought a little bit about what are the kind of if-then scenarios that you have just in general. You know, if, if someone is aggressive, here's how you can respond to diffuse the situation. If someone is a bit depressed and they seem down, how do you respond in a way that's comfortable for you? Uh, and also comfortable for them. And these are the sorts of things where the more you experience these situations, the more you start to develop a toolkit in that area. But it's also true that there are certain situations that you're never really prepared for, uh, and actually taking some courses around those can be really helpful. And that's especially true when it comes to well-being, uh, when it comes to mental health and physical health, things like domestic violence, there are all sorts of unexpected things that you might encounter. And the university does offer a wide range of courses. And you can find these things online and at other institutions as well. So if you're worried about any particular situations and you want to make sure that you are comfortable dealing with those, you can get some resources so that you do have, in advance, some knowledge about how you might immediately respond in an appropriate way. Finally, once you know your approach, you can and should be selecting your appropriate communication. So you have your little list of what's possible and immediately, based on your judgment, you're crossing certain things out and you're keeping certain things. And that way you'll just know which wording, where to talk, what body language to use and so on are going to help your message go down as smoothly as possible. And a lot of this, as I said, it is down to practice, it is down to preparation, and it's also down to experience. And a lot of um, what you can learn then is to reflect on what you've gone through and to plan for things in advance, to talk to other people, and to just be really aware of all of this so that you can apply it whenever you do need it, whenever it does come up. That brings us to the end of the supervision session. Underneath this video, I am going to post some scenarios that I have developed for use in training of doctoral supervisors. So if you are thinking about doctoral supervision in advance of uh, actually becoming a supervisor yourself, rather than worrying about how to navigate the process as a student, you might find it interesting to look through those and think about the sorts of things that supervisors will encounter. And many of the scenarios are kind of the worst case circumstances. These aren't things that happen a lot, but almost all of them have been developed uh, on the back of things that have actually happened at my institution or uh, at institutions elsewhere that I've then read about in the news. So these are the sorts of things that do come up. And as you read through those, you may not know certain answers, but you can begin to think about where communication 
might play a role. So where could better, have, better communication have prevented a problem from emerging or addressed it earlier on? Or how might communication be used now in order to fix the problem now that it's emerged? And you can also perhaps think about different supervisory styles and how different styles might have led to those circumstances and which style might now be more appropriate for responding given the, the way things are. So hopefully that will give you a little bit more of a practical way to apply some of the concepts that we've looked at throughout this session. If you do have any further questions about supervision, about different scenarios, about different styles, about different aspects of supervision, then do feel free to get in touch. You can also look at the list of references that I'm providing underneath this video. Although I know that everyone's time is limited, there are some really nice books in there that you might want to look at that address questions from both uh, academics and students' point of views. And you're also more than welcome to get in touch if you have any comments. But I hope that this has been interesting and informative and gives, gives you some tools to use in approaching your own supervisory relationships.